thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let to Be Talked. Today will be a new music episode. Over the last 12 years, I've uh, presented a lot of new bands on here, and they've gone on to do some big shit. Like one of them I, I uh, can think of right away would be Rival Sons or Greta Van Fleet. A lot of these bands I had on when they were totally unknown. So here we are again, and this is The Feel or feel how are you guys doing Good. well yeah thanks well, for having us introduce yourselves i'm tj i'm the drummer in the band currently also the manager engineer booking agent social media yeah i'm tyler armstrong i play guitar and tj and i share some the recording duties and things like that but i play guitar yeah, man. Great to have you guys on. I don't know where you are, but that looks like a fucking dream room to me. When I was in a band as a young guy, that looks like something that everybody wants. Just, I don't know if it's your recording studio or where you're at, but it looks kick-ass. What is that? So we're in a town right outside of St. Louis called Alton, Illinois. And me and a guy named Nick Bufano own a studio called Harbor Studio. And this is the control room, live rooms over there. And it's a good hang. Yeah, it's a good time. St. Louis. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be there this week. Are you guys in town? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. I yeah, think doing so. the uh, yeah. what is that? The Fox there? Oh shoot! Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. a great theater. Oh yeah, I got to have you guys come to the show, man. It's going to be built. Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hi, dude. It. Yeah, right on. That's a great theater. Like a, it has it's had some legendary shows there as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, I did the Fox in Atlanta, and that's where the classic uh, live, you know, Skinner record was done. You know, play it pretty for Atlanta. But uh, <laughs> I, it's it's really cool to have you guys on. And it was interesting to hear what you just said. I'm the, uh, you know, engineer, the drummer, the fucking social media, the, the blah, blah, blah. It is a different animal to play music these days. And if you don't do any of that, you will basically be unknown because this is how I found you on instagram yeah absolutely and that's what's kind of crazy i mean the amount of people that like <clears throat> you know i mean we've been doing this for now i mean tyler and i've been trying to make it in bands for geez probably like eight years now but like with this band we've been doing it for a couple years and with the current lineup only since like mid last year and the amount of like just weird connections that have come up through social media stuff or you know some of our heroes that are like holy shit, like they just followed us and like, or like sent us a DM or something. Like it's, it's wild. And, and as much as like, it does suck if you're not wired to like it, it's also pretty great because we're in St. Louis, Missouri and dudes that, w you know, might have never had a chance to see us are, are hearing about us seeing, you know, what we're trying to do and everything. So that side of it's, totally. you know, awesome. Well, yeah, you got to think about, it's basically the modern day version of tape trading or going out and flying. When I fucking played music, dude, you had to go out at night to some band playing and flyer their fucking fans. Hey man, we're playing Friday. Come see us. And it was just God awful. Cause somebody might walk away and just toss your flyer on the ground and you have no money. You just spent all this money at Kinko's or you're stapling them up on a telephone pole. And then yes. you're sending demos out. It's a, uh, it's it, it's a double edged sword. I mean, on you know, on one point, you're like, you know, there's people that are like, I'm an artist. I don't fuck with that. And it's <laughs> like, well, good luck, good luck, man. I'm 58 and I'm on it all day, every day to get butts in the seats to see me do comedy. And it sucks, but at the same time, it's almost like mining for gold. At any time, something could go viral and skyrocket you. Totally. totally. And that's like, we've talked about that a lot. And that's why like, we've put so much effort into that in the past, you know, year, because we I mean, unfortunately, we've known and still know so many, you know, like you're saying, amazing artists, like musicians, or even guys from the past that were like, man, how are they not a household name? And the fact that nowadays, it's like, sitting on my ass on the couch and like making a post could get us one step further or, um, you know, like, we've had people show up to shows in Florida when we did a run with uh, this band Blackberry Smoke. And they're like, oh, yeah, I flew down for you guys because I saw a clip on TikTok. And we're, it's like, yeah, what? Like, OK, well, then I guess it's all worth it. You know, it's annoying. But like if, if that's 
the reality of what can happen, then man, it's 100% worth the effort, which I'm sure, you know, uh, like you're saying with, with your career. And, and I, I find it cool just how many parallels there are with like comedy and music, but like, that's such a huge one nowadays, I think for sure. Sure. Yeah. And with, it's kind of the wild west too, just like music sort of used to be and always has been, but TJ is skilled with the actual putting the social media together and uh, the videos and things like that. But we, we discuss it deeply all the time. Like we'll text each other. It's almost every morning, like at 8 a.m. It's like, Hey, should we post it like this? And we, we used to be like, we should be really strategic doing it like this. But then we were like, well, I don't know. Let's just see what happens. And yeah, cause no one knows. And thankfully a lot of people are, starting to see what's going on with us but uh, yeah it's it's kind of just a big i don't know a lot of the time but we've been totally. blessed that it's kind of working out yeah i shot it over when i first saw it i shot it over to jay buchanan who's a great friend of mine i shot oh, it right over, on. i shot it over to marcus king and Wait. i shot it over to scott scott ian from anthrax and his wife pearl they love rock and roll Sick. And, and then I shot it over to Jason Flom, who was basically the owner of uh, Lava Records. Lava? Signed, yeah. Yeah, signed Greta Van Fleet. Yeah. And when I had him on the show, he was like, if you know any rock bands, send them to me because I'm signing rock. Now, it's very rare that I play that card because if you play that card too many times with something that's not good, they're going to be like, oh, hey, dude, you keep sending me garbage, you know? Oh, yeah. But, the thing that I liked about you guys, and I think that what is very crucial in this world, quote unquote, bringing rock back, which makes me fucking furious when someone says that because it never went away. Yeah, uh, sure. The people, as they get older, they lose interest in finding new music. And I'm always looking for new music. But a lot of people will send me over the quote unquote, you know, here's a new band they're, they're bringing rock back and it's, they don't have the songs, you know, they got the outfit and the haircut and the fucking marshals, but they don't have the songs. And it's very rare over the years of the last 10 years, I would say where I see a band and I go, this is it. They're authentic. They got the song and the look they're doing this. They love this. And bands like Rival Sons was one of them or Marcus King. When I see him, I go, oh, my God, this is it. So I wanted to give you guys some accolades on that because it was just incredible to see how good you guys are. And yet you still you have songs, you know? Yeah, we appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it's right that. Yeah, that means a lot because, man, I, like you talk about, I mean, we see a lot of, you know, what we're talking about and, and we don't like, you know, trashing on other bands, but we do recognize, especially within the past couple of years, how it's like, oh yeah, you know, the rock's a thing now. And so there's, you know, dudes that, you know, yeah, they dress the part, but they're playing, you know, the most simple song you've ever heard. And it's like, hey, that's great if you're able to build a fan base and do that. But like the reason that like at least Tyler and I, and I don't want to speak for him, but I, I mean, we talk about this all the time, like why we love the kind of music we're making is because like, if you really pay attention to music history and you like appreciate it, the thing about like the late sixties, early seventies music was like, that was such an incredible time where like the, the artistry was still being funded by major labels. So like you had these extremely artistic acts that were, you know, performing, in a super emotional way, like, you know, like some of our favorites, you know, Zeppelin, it's like those guys are emoting on stage their instrument and they're being, you know, labels and management and all this stuff are behind them and they're, they're letting these artists genuinely explore and emote and, and do that type of thing. And because of that, like a uh, special period in time, that's why we're so into that music. And so like when we're making our own, I know at least for me, it's like I'm listening to that music and the music that those guys were listening to to inspire my playing rather than listening to it, you know, watered down 10 times from that point. You know, I mean, we love, I mean, both Ty and I love Rival Sons. Probably the greatest show we've talked about we've ever been to is Rival Sons Rival Son show. And we actually got to open for them like a year or so ago. 
but like if we only listened to rival sons oh, yeah. and marcus king we wouldn't have our own thing and i think that's what's like we just value a lot and honestly wish we <laughs> knew more guys were were we could tell like oh you're you're also listening to the bands that uh you know from back then that were killing it but also who they were listening to yeah but i mean the i, I think first and foremost we're like TJ was saying, maybe a easier way to say it is we're just we're fans of music and fans of a ton a different kind of music. In the band van we're listening to Buck Owens and also, you know, anything Coltrane or Miles Davis and not really a whole lot of rock stuff, but it's 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 just a word we keep hearing is authentic. And it's that's a very that's a very great thing to hear, not because we can pat ourselves on the back and say, We're real, man. But it's just us and we're capable of different things. And like the song Brother you brought up, someone can hear that and everyone goes, man, they're influenced by free a ton. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, why wouldn't we be? Yeah. But also I hear like for me, guitarist Ollie Hossel from Pato and things like that. And TJ Mitch Mitchell and, you know, Roger. I mean, it is pretty awesome. Andy Frazier kind of stuff. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's just the point. Like. First and foremost, we're, we're fans of music and we connect with those dudes. I don't know if we're really trying to be anything per se. I think that's kind of what the, the point you're you're making. Yeah. Well, yeah, if you look at it and I would say every 10 years or so, there comes a couple guys that fucking get it right and they rise above. And even if you look at, I think what a lot of these bands do wrong is they they get the songwriting last. So they get the outfit, they get the Marshall, they get the Les Paul, they got the hair, and then they go, oh, we need some songs. And then they're like, ooh, baby, baby, backseat, you know? And it's like, perfect example of all of that was when I was, you know, playing music, here came here comes the Black Crows, and they're still playing right now because yeah. of fantastic songs. Here comes Lenny Kravitz. He's fucking bigger than ever and it's still brilliant. killing it. And his songwriting, you know, and then you, you go another fucking five years, and and here comes like Alice in Chains. Here's Blind Melon, you know, these bands that had songs. And it keeps going. Then if 10 more years, here comes the strokes, you know? Oh, fuck. These guys got songs and they're totally, you know, got attitude and they're the real deal. So, you know, there's always going to be some bands that get it. And then the rest will be these spinoffs that are just, you know, and unfortunately, as much as I talk about it on the show, I get it. Most people are just looking at something like, oh, Dean's going to like these guys. Look at this look right here, you know, but yeah. that's OK, because not everybody can be into like the full on art of rock and roll, you know, but <laughs> you guys I definitely got something going. Now, let's get into a little bit of history. I think I saw another singer at one point in a video he was playing like guitar and had short hair so what is the history of feel okay so tj and i were in a band oh i don't know how many years ago at this point yeah called nick buffano and the innocence back to the guy who i have the studio with from the ashes of that started feel and that was tj myself roger linhart on bass and a guy named dylan wolfong who sang with us for a bit and dylan just wanted some other things in life and that's kind of he, he basically said, and we came to mutual agreement, it's a good time to step off instead of uh, jumping out of the plane, you know, when, when it took off or anything like that. And then we kind of announced, we tried a few people, it didn't really work out. Then we announced that we were looking for a singer. And then that's when Garrett Barkis from Sacramento came in and he didn't reach out to us. It was his friend yeah. who said, I've been telling him you're the right singer for this band since you guys first came out. And so we have some releases out with Dylan, but really all this started and I hate to say start to discount anything we've done in the past, but the, 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 when the ball started rolling it was pretty much September, 2023. And that's the, where the lineup is now with Garrett. Yeah. And prior to, to Garrett. So with that last singer, Dylan, 
um, we were having some like local success and like got on some cool shows opening for like Cheap Trick and 38 Special and like uh, Keishi, that's the like legendary um, radio station around here, started playing our stuff and um and, and that was super cool and like we're we were like all right cool like this is you know people are catching on that we've got something unique here but yeah again you know he kind of decided to go his own way but i think because we had a little of that success then getting garrett he he was able to see like yo these guys you know they are the real deal they have potential and then he came in and i mean man he's just it, it's so weird how like every single member of this band i feel like it's just like clicked like I wouldn't even get into the story of like how we found Roger, but it's it's just like totally just luck. And Roger is the most unique and incredible bass player I've ever played with. And so that lined up perfectly. And then, yeah, Garrett coming in from Sacramento and our, our first kind of introduction with him, we had like an instrumental of a song written for a while <clears throat> and Tyler shot it over to him when we were sort of like in the auditioning phase and was like, hey, like what what could you do with this this song like what would you write lyric wise and like whatever and literally within like three hours he sent us back something and tyler showed it to me like the next day and it, it was incredible and it ended up being what our the first single we put out that's called find a love um it was that and we were just like man we've never worked with a singer that just uh, brought something different to the table but spoke the same vocabulary and so yeah, so since then we've been working with him and recording with him, playing shows, and yeah, that that's there's a lot more detail in, in in weird ways that this band has come together, but that's the brief history of like the past you know year or two. Now, Garrett was he in bands in Sacramento? Because I'm out in California, and I I know uh, a lot of uh, people out there and stuff. Was he in a band before? Yeah, he was primarily in a group with his brother-in-law called Greedy Lion. And unfortunately, his brother-in-law passed away. So that band dissolved just due to emotional things and whatnot, understandable. But oddly enough, on our live EP, one of the things that's not included, right before we played Brother, he said he was just so thankful and it was talking to the crowd and said, this is my 30th gig ever. So Garrett's kind of new to the like world of music. He's only been singing for a little bit. And that's also, we we're just like, wow, man. Yeah, the more he sings, the better it gets. So <laughs> right on. Like, so we, we got him pretty green. Yeah. Wow. And how old are you guys? I'm 28. I'm 28. Roger's 27, turning 28. And Garrett is 25. Yeah. He's the baby. Wow. Yeah. Killer. It's it's funny because when you hear Garrett, of course, you know where he's coming from. He's got some Robinson in there and he's got some, you know, Paul Rogers and and. And he also has some, so he does do Faces, some Faces covers and uh, some Beatles covers and stuff. So, so he's got all the flavor. All of you guys being at the age you are, was it your parents or, a, you know, somebody that, you know, you're not into hip hop, of course, because that's been huge over the years. But what was it that, you know, it's usually cool parents when I talk to younger bands. For me, I actually didn't really like grow up listening to the kind of rock that like I'm into now, weirdly. My parents always had music on in the house, but it, they actually just listened to like modern country. So and, you know, on one hand, it's like, OK, it's modern country music. But it was also early 2000s country. So, you know, once I started playing the drums, all of a sudden I learned, oh, I grew up listening to Chris McHugh and, you know, Aaron Sterling and Larry London and like these legendary session drummers. And so like the when it comes to like sounds and feel and all that stuff, I'm like, oh, that, that's where the love of music and drums was instilled. And then as I started to like take it more seriously, then obviously I, I got into, you know, more of like the old school rock stuff. And then honestly, since me and Tyler met and started like playing music together i mean i was all, all already like into you know zeppelin and and a bunch of the typical kind of bands from that era but he started turning me on to like even further back stuff and you know and so he and i sort of like he's been much more into that stuff for a longer period but for me it was like later and through that i think it was great because it wasn't just you know oh i've heard ACDC my whole life so I'm gonna play ACDC it was like oh no I'm actually I'm really interested in like you know the specifics of what makes John Bonham's playing 
the way it is as opposed to like oh he hits hard <laughs> you know yeah. so um, so anyway that's that's sort of my uh how i got really into it mine is uh i was typical kid i guess they said i came home and i was hitting pots and pans and stuff like that and my direct musical influences really came. I've said this in an interview not too long ago. A lot of it came like from T- what Tito was saying, what my parents were listening to initially, which was contemporary Christian music. Wow. Which had a ton of melody and basically the same players that were playing on country stuff are yeah. all on Christian music. <laughs> yeah, that, right. And then it's all in Nashville. So just great players, great parts melodically. As I grew older and, you know, my parents never said I couldn't listen to secular music, of course, but, you know, you listen to what they're doing. My dad's a child of the 70s. He listened to AM, so Boston and Kansas and Wings and ELO and, you know, all those bands I love. But I went a little heavier route when I got into the Zeppelins and the Deep Purples and things like that. But when I'm into something, I'm really into it. Like, probably like to uh, the point where it's annoying to some people. But when it came to 60s and 70s music, I just went head first. So, I mean, I hate to say that I influenced myself. That sounds very pretentious, but <laughs> I I just kept listening and listening. But yeah, a lot of it had to do with my dad and honestly, YouTube, like YouTube's a beautiful thing. You just search top 10 best guitarists of all time when I first started playing and it was Hendrix, Dwayne Allman, Alex Lyson, Jimmy Page, all these people. And so I just went on a Indiana Jones search for the Holy Grail of music <laughs> and then that spread out through rock i was just a rock guy i was like man if it's not i, I used to hate i always say i used to hate the beatles until i actually listened to them that sort of thing so you know we're, it's it's pretty vast and related to that too and then well we'll get back to that thing is when you were talking about garrett and the the faces and paul rogers and stuff it's interesting because i i actually i really don't know i'm sure he had listened to that stuff but what he really loved he got started because his brother-in-law said man you could sing he was singing a bunch of ray charles yeah. But that makes sense because you hear people like Steve Marriott, Paul Rogers and stuff, and they were obviously listening to Ray Charles and, you know, Otis Redding and things like that. So even more so than TJ and I, Garrett's kind of like not influenced by the rock. Yeah. He's influenced by the R&B. But anyway, yeah, so I guess that's how I got into music. I don't know. Well, and I think an interesting thing like connected with that like what we're getting at is Tyler and I are both I mean we're just obsessed with our crafts like I and I say that to like point out that you know rock is not all that we know it's just what we love the most be- kind of like because what I was saying earlier it's like man I just feel like the ability to be able to like emote through your instrument and and do you know create art on on stage I think is done in in the most, at least for us, most genuine way through the type of music we play. But like after growing up, you know, he and I both pursued music just just pretty hardcore. I mean, I went and I, I got my degree in audio engineering and uh, he went to he was at MTSU for a while and was ended up doing session work in Nashville for a while. And, you know, my goal was to be like a hired gun and, you know, just play drums for a living, getting hired by people. But then, you know, you ask any of those guys who are doing it and most of them would say, Hey, if you could be in any band of all time, what would it be? And they're like, Oh, well, Led Zeppelin. Duh. Like, so I think for me and Tyler, it's like, you know, we, we just have pursued, have tried to pursue our individual crafts at such a high level that they're, that we're kind of came together and are like, well, what's the like most fun way to get to play music together oh well it's this type of music yeah. that at the end of the day we we love the most so and i don't know if that was a conscious discussion but the thing about yeah. rock is i think with a david lee roth quote i can't believe i'm about to quote david lee roth <laughs> but I, I i love dave and i love yeah, he's, he is one of the kings oh yeah. totally man he said something along the lines of rock is is superior you know whatever that means because it's not just music and that's true for all of music, but the interesting thing about rock is a jazzer is going to shoot me for saying this, but it's kind of the, in my opinion, the genre that can be the most vast within one genre. I mean, how many subgenres do you have of rock? Now it's like indie and all this stuff. That's still rock. So it's really like jazz, pop, blues at its core. That's what rock music is, and people have expanded on it. So really, I feel of what we're, 
what we've released and what we're continuing to write is relatable to folks because it does touch on all of those aspects melodically power and intensity and energy and to, you know we have stuff that's just as much humble pie as it is the acoustic stuff america or laurel canyon and uh, you know it's the dynamic of it and that that's why i love i love rock <laughs> so yeah. much yeah once you guys get garrett does he move out to st louis or is it kind of a cross-country type of thing well we're like busy enough to the point that he's like pretty much always here but he will go home for he, he splits his time essentially it just it depends how hectic our schedule is which right now it's a little nutso and it's going to get yeah. continue to get even more nutso so so no he doesn't technically live in st louis but he's been a he's adopted yeah <laughs> sort of yeah i gotta tell you some of the tones are fantastic there's the the video that i think it's like four or five songs and it's in a, a studio i don't know if it's in the studio next door there or whatever it has like the mark yeah okay so the quality of these live videos in there are fantastic and the the filming of them looks amazing. Who did that? Just you guys? Yeah. DJs, yeah. Like I said, well, I, I don't want to discount anything else, too. I'll make this really short. We have the most unique community. Yeah. In that our best friends are world class with media, marketing, graphic design. It, it It's insane. So shout out to like Cameron Alvers. Because any yeah. the, the stuff that's not iPhone video and some of this is Cameron. He's amazing. Yeah. When it can, comes to that stuff, TJ does have a background with uh, some visual things. Yeah. So that's all him. So he is to blame for that specific video. When it comes to the recording stuff, like TJ said, we are so, you know, have dove into it, specifically TJ and I with sounds and the instruments and the tones and so much that it's like, it's just what we do. Everything that's ever been recorded of us has come down to TJ and I mixing. Yeah. Mastering is not us, but yeah. So that's just us and experience of spending so much time with, this is the sound we're going to, we want. So I'm going to use this. I'm going to use this kit, tune it this way, this amp, use it this way. But yeah, that specific yeah. video you're talking about was just obviously completely live and we just kind of went for it. Yeah. And that well, was that sounds was, fantastic. Oh, thanks. oh yeah. Thanks. That was like recorded like, oh man, maybe like Garrett had been in the band maybe like two weeks. Yeah. He it was one of his first times around here. And like, well, I think it was his, we'd auditioned him. And then I think that might have been <clears throat> the first trip where we're like, I think we recorded our first music video and had some other stuff. And we were like, hey, actually, right before it was right before he left. And I think I said, I, one of us had the idea and I was like, yo, we should probably, we should just do a live in the studio thing of like four or five songs. I, I have access to some cameras and obviously I like, I, I, I have some experience in, in video editing. So I was like, I'll, you know, I'll do all that. But like, I don't know if we want to put this out on social media, if it's good enough quality, sure, whatever. But if it's not, we'll at least put it in our booking emails so that we can show like, hey, this is how we perform live. Not, you know, there's no overdubs in this. There's no whatever. This is what we sound like. And so we did that within just one night, just ran the songs a bunch and it was stressful. But but yeah, so that was all like, yeah, he had not been in it very long. And, you know, that honestly, it's a testament to him and just how, man, how incredible of a of a musician and how just talented and, and quick to learn that dude is because yeah. he and, nailed it. And it testament to and i guess the personal how proud i am of us as a, as a band and i always say that because i'm the guitar player and i got long hair and i wear tight jeans and all that crap so like i do like i a lot of people will talk to me but i'm like it's so great to know that i don't have to worry about anybody in my band i always say i'm the least talented whatever that means but i am in the band but we kind of it's hard for us to listen to that video Oh, I, get I get it. I understand that because it was, you know, a while ago and now you're so much better. It's like, I'm glad people dig it, but it's like, man, come see us now, man. Yeah. Well, that's the good thing. You know, it's a, it's a lot like with comedy. It's like, ah, people are like, oh, I love that bit. And it's like, well, it's been five years now. I'm so much better than that, you know? 
which is cool because then if people show up, they go, Holy shit, these guys are fire, you know? But yeah. what was good about it was right away, the quality was really good to be able to listen to it and understand right away. I go, Oh, this is live. These guys are playing this in there. And I'm not one of those guys that like, there's no tapes. They're playing, you know, they play instrument. It's like, yeah, yeah. You know, we understand there's all different versions of live people out there, but it sounded great. And, you know, I'm a huge free guy. And awesome. yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, Paul, like you were playing and your tone was really fucking good. The drumming was fantastic. Usually a band, the drummer is always the weak link. You know, I'm like, ah, the drummer's lagging here, you know, or whatever. But the drumming was fantastic. And then the bass player, of course, great. And then the singing was really good. And I was like, all right, this is this is on. I'll have them on the show and I'll and I'll tell people about them, you know? Yeah. Well, we appreciate that, man. I mean, it's like kind of like what you're talking about. Like the other reason we did that video and, and part of like what we are kind of about as a band is like you know we're, we're all just music lovers and that that even goes to like modern music i mean man that some of our favorite bands are our bands that have made music in the, in the past 10 years and so like the whole like tracks thing and overdubs thing for live records and all that like that that's a thing we're not here to say that that's invalid but the problem is that it, it just seems like that's just the standard now is right. like you know right. oh you're on a gig well you're playing with ableton and click and all this stuff and again we've done all that for with in different scenarios and it's it's fine and, and in some ways it's like man that's what that gig needs but like with the music we're doing it's like man why are there bands that are playing this type of thing and then they're going and half the guitars are fake or i'm not gonna say who but we opened for a band once who was literally piping in crowd noise in oh, yeah. their tracks and and so we're like no, what is this? Like, uh, at least for, for Tyler and I, like, what was so incredible about Zeppelin, I guess I won't speak for him, but, like, for me, it's, like, I don't, I'm not as much about, like, uh, you know, oh, yeah, Stairway, Black Dog, whatever. For me, it's, like, no, I want live, dazed, and confused oh, yeah. that goes on for a half hour. Like, yeah. that's the reason Zeppelin was who they were, because those guys, you know... We've talked about this before, and I mean, I don't know how people that actually play jazz would feel about it, but like, I feel like, you know, the structure of what Led Zeppelin would play was much more like jazz than it was rock. Like, of course. And, you know, they have a head, then they have impro like sections where they improvise, they reference other stuff, and they come back to the head. And like, that's the type of stuff that we love playing, and that we feel like even some of the, you know, the really cool bands that are playing cool rock nowadays, it's like, I don't see him doing a lot of that. And we want to, you know, well, let's, there, let's do that then, I guess, you the, know. The the jam scene is definitely healthy. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, it's totally, super yeah. healthy. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit more of a dead guy than the other dudes in the band. Roger likes him, so, and they all like him well enough. But it, it's not like we're the only band that jams. Yeah, That's yeah, not totally. the thing. But... It's not really a but. It's just a. It's just a thing of like we're just playing the kind of music that has freedom within it, and it's it just it just feels right, and it's 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 fun to connect in that way. It, this whole thing is whether it was back in the seventies or the thirteen hundreds or right now talking to you, you saying you dig it is us connecting and being one within that that moment, and uh, it's getting a little hippie with it, but it, it's true. <laughs> it's like that's what makes it so powerful. Is like at, in that one moment, everyone's like, I agree, right on. Well, I'll tell you this right now. Without the jamming in the Black Crows, they would have been done after that first record. Because what would happen is they had the great song. She talks to angels, Remedy, Jealous. Sorry, Remedy's on, on Southern, but Jealous again. They had the radio hits and stuff. But once they get into the Almond Brothers type of jamming of Wiser Time and and that whole scene, as the scene that they were in was starting to dissipate, they were able to move into another audience that were like, oh, wow, these fucking guys can play the shit out of their instruments and they're taking us for a ride. And, you know, Zeppelin being my all time favorite, 
all the different eras of their jamming is like the Black Crows, different eras is just incredible. You know, you got 69, which is really radical blues in your yeah. face wild. Then you get into the 72 era, 73, the long, long shows like Song Remains the Same type of stuff. That's just mind boggling, you know, and really taught me actually like, oh, yeah, you can go way outside the box. And the deeper tracks are way cooler than the radio tracks, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think about bands like the kind of, the kind of a way to the really get into like describing pinpointing it is like bands like that they just don't you can't pity. I love ACDC, especially the '70s stuff with Bond. But I love all of it. They have an identity and they own it, so that's a whole different thing. But a band like Chicago, who I love and TJ loves too, people always say, "Well, where they are horn band." with with guitars or a rock band or the rock band, band that has who it's like <laughs> yeah. even the Beatles it's like we don't know and that's what's interesting that's what it's freedom you know it's freedom within it to musically and the you know in a, in a, a spiritual way it's like you know it's it just is what it is but also you don't know what it is which is pretty cool yeah. was there ever, well, ever thoughts of adding some b3 to the band yeah we've talked about it many times yeah it just hasn't been the right time and the right person also because if we're gonna have someone to do that there we're kind of running out of chances for people just to randomly fit perfectly yeah. like roger yeah. and Garrett. <laughs> it's as, as we grow those things because just like tj said he's a live zeppelin guy i do love live zeppelin the bootlegs and everything i'm really like a house of the holy dude when they get when jimmy starts to get really deep into things and layers and we have some stuff we're recording and some songs that you'll definitely display that sort of creativity with it. So it's just going to come up and uh, I don't play B3. So. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's funny how much the black crows changed once Eddie got into the band and Southern harmony comes out and then the, you know, Amorica and three snakes is like, Oh wow. You know, and all the different keyboard atmosphere, you know, that, that whole vibe of the band, it's a lot like when, John Paul Jones goes over and plays the whirly and shit. You're just like, oh my God, this is just yeah. so another level. And 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 man, I just I hear it on some of the stuff, you know, when you guys are playing. I'm like, oh, here's like a B3 just swell, you know, you know. Yeah. So does every guy who plays keys and has a TikTok because they're like, oh man, let me play on your band. <laughs> well, right? but like, yeah, but back to like what you're at, talking about, you know, we're, we are just so like into sounds and whatever. So like those types of things, we actually have a song that I think we're going to be re-recording. We haven't played as much live recently, but like one of the sections had a very like Faces-esque Whirly solo and the previous singer, like we'd bring out the Whirly and he'd play that and whatever. So it's definitely something that we're like, we're not closed minded about, but we also very much like uh, we feel very much like a band. And so kind of like what he's saying, it's like, man, we found the perfect person yeah. that is willing to, you know, I mean, not only fit in with us all musically, but also be willing to like, <laughs> you know, sacrifice yeah. and do what it takes to like make this, you know, your so career. Right. Then one hundred percent, and and if it fits the music too, you know, like that's, that's kind of like yeah. all going all the way back to what you're saying in the beginning. Like the reason, you know, I mean, we might disagree, but the reason, you know, like you're saying the songs are there is like because that's what we care about. <laughs> you know, we we di didn't say like, man, we got to start this '70s inspired rock band. Now let's write, you know, the material. It was like, no, we just are making music we love. Mm -hmm. um and that goes down to the sounds the playing the the authenticity of it like it actually being us on our instruments as opposed to like you know just trying to emulate someone from then uh, it's so it's, it's got to fit and like tj yeah. said we're, we're confident where it's at on the other hand i'm not saying we're going to turn into a prog band i love yes i love genesis the early stuff specifically so i've got an old mini moog i've got the roads and the whirlies and things like that but yeah, we've talked about it a bunch. We've talked about it as kind of a utility guy, like a yeah. Kendall, but more <laughs> so like income. like Roger Manning from. He always sure. pops in my head. He's playing keys. He's going to guitar. Yeah. I can't remember the dude's name, but I I always watch the UFO videos. That left-handed dude with the Firebird. 
He'd be playing. Oh yeah. Boom, boom, down, down, lights out, and all that. So that could be cool too. But it's just a, it's it's not the right time. What about you know? I mean, I know there's absolutely no money in music these days. It's or any time really, unless you really hit it. People are always like, but you know, the whole fucking streaming platform and all of that is just brutal. Day jobs for you guys? What do you guys do? So I do like audiovisual tech stuff, you know, sometimes, you know, like at churches or in like live sound type things. And I also do some like video work with that stuff as well. And then I'll, I'll do freelance sessions either here at the studio or just like with my own remote setup at the house. So yeah, it's definitely something where, you know, we all have day jobs, so... Yeah, I have a really easy life. <laughs> I I play guitar all day and I I deal in vintage guitars. Oh and great. So I'm, yeah, I'm associated with the shop that sells I I run the joint for vintage guitars and vintage clothes, vinyl. Oh, but I, that's what I used to do, man. I'd flip oh. amps and guitars yeah. and and everything and you know that you got to have multiple, you know, revenue streams to do yeah. art, which is nothing wrong with that as long as you can keep doing the art. That's what's fucking, that's the main prize. Totally. Sure. Totally. Well, and man, it's funny you say that. I was literally, last night, me and Garrett, the singer, were like talking about that and how, you know, like Tyler and I, our whole background doing what we do and, you know, him, even even down to the flipping of guitar, like I, I've spent years flipping drums too. And, and you know, I'm a, such a drum nerd when it comes to gear and like vintage stuff. And the amazing thing about all those side things is that they, they've all been in pursuit of the art though. And in a cool way, they've played out, you know, like, us flipping gear, well, we figured out what we like, what we don't like, what this thing does, what it doesn't do, uh, what stuff is durable or what stuff's going to blow up on the road. <laughs> um, and then, you know, uh, kind of like we are talking about earlier, it's like, well, for me, the the freelance uh, or doing the AV stuff and video stuff has led to us being able to, like, create content for the band. But anyway, what, like, Garrett and I uh, were talking about is, like, man, it's cool to see this stuff finally happen that will allow us to not have to lean into the side stuff as much because then all we have to focus on is the art. And for all of us, that's been the dream the whole time. And, you know, it's, it's, we've always said, we're like, man, if we can make a living doing this, that's it. You know, obviously the dream for, for any band is, oh yeah, I played sold out arenas and all that. Like, we're not going to sell our dream short, but we're also like, man, if, all I have to do is play drums and and pursue this type of art. Like I, I've got the best life, at, you know, who, who needs retirement? And so I think that's just a philosophy we all have with this. You know, we just care so much about what this thing we're doing. Yeah. I tell, I tell people that all the time. They're like, man, you should be huge, man. I don't understand. Like, you know, you're out there and you're funny. And, and it's like, Hey, what you don't understand is I'm 58. And I've been doing comedy for a living for the last 12 years. Man, <laughs> you're, you're putting a monetary label on, on success. And I'm putting a what I'm doing for a living as success. I'm doing comedy every fucking night. I've made it. Do you understand? Yeah. I fucking have made it. And people, they are yeah. just unbelievably clueless when it comes to like they'll just say shit to your face that you can't believe and you're like hey man do you understand i haven't worked at the motorcycle shop for 12 fucking years is complete superstardom oh yeah that yeah. is fucking and fat. props props to you big time because like uh uh, I don't, we'll get into it, but like, I'm, I'm a big fan of like comedy, comedy podcasts. I've checked out your stuff and it's like, you know, for you guys, even it's even more intense. Cause you know, we've got a band of us together. You guys is like, Hey, it's me. <laughs> I'm showing up to this club across the country and doing this. But like, yeah, like that's incredible to be able to, that you are only doing that. And it is just funny how you get out and, you know, the people that are, you know, just counting down days till retirement are like, Oh, how come, you know, when are you going to make it? It's like, yeah, well, it's the whole thing, though. It's okay, though, that people don't get it because yeah, if yeah. they did, oh. then they'd 
everyone would do it, blah, 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 that cliche, but it is, it's not interesting. It's just a a thing we're experiencing. I talk about my life and not, not in stair steps because that makes it seem like I'm stepping on people, but it's, it's an elevator. It's an escalator of things that just one thing after the other, this, 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 and just the fact that it's starting to become more of a reality that, oh man, like uh, those who have to take PTO, well, they're just going to be PT zero because you just can't do it anymore. It's like, yep. that's all awesome. like right on, like we're just busy and it's just cool that people are digging it, man. And it's just, it's really tight. Let's get into the gear now. AC 15s or, you know, that seems to be what you were playing when I looked at it. And I don't know if those are new or vintage, but I love Vox, but it's interesting because, you know, the sounds that you guys are getting are, you know, big Marshall sounds. Uh, a lot of those bands use and when you go into these places now and you bring a Marshall half stack or full stack, they're like, can you turn that down? Can you turn it down a little more? That's just going to be too loud. And it's really a different atmosphere now. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I do this Bon Scott tribute once a year and it's full Marshalls all the way across the stage. But when I played music, it was just a AC 15 or a matchless lightning 15 and it was still too loud for people. You know, you'd be at the, like the Viper room and they're like, we're going to need to turn that down. So what is the amps that you guys use? Do you go in with the big amps? Well, it just depends on the gig. Like like TJ mentioned, if we're out with Blackberry Smoke, uh, which we love those guys. They've become good friends of ours and they rock yeah, super hard. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to bring out the big amp. But, you know, but I also... <laughs> It's it's no surprise. I bring out small amps too. I've got the two amps that I brought out in this last run was a sixty seven Marshall. It's a model nineteen seventy three. So it's an eighteen watt two twelve. Love it. Pretty almost rare as hen's teeth. I'm happy to have that. And then a sixty five AC fifteen together and what dry rig. But those are still pretty loud. I mean, those are cooking over a hundred decibels together. But I've got at risk of sounding pretentious. I have just. I've got a lot of it. I got a lot of vintage amps. I got a lot of vintage guitars. Just like the nature of flipping and just people being gracious enough to say, well, I can't take it with me. Here you go, man. I'm like, whoa. Wow. Uh, yeah, I did some serious stuff too. But yeah, anything. TJ has an extensive vintage drum collection. He's using some newer Ludwigs that sound amazing. They're they're maple, but they're like still loud, which is awesome. As far as bass, live, Roger's using a old vintage Ampeg V4B. So it's like a hundred watt version of the SVT because a 300 watt SVT, that's a, that's a whole lot. That's money. <laughs> yeah. And I've got one, but it's never going to see a lot of day. And then for me, I don't know. I got a lot of old Marshall and high watt and box stuff and whatever, but any, pretty much anything you see is, is vintage on stage. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny to think about like a class, a say a matchless. That's uh -huh. Eight watts is so fucking loud. You can't even believe it. You're like, wow. Yeah, my friend Obed Khan, he designs all the magnetone stuff. The new oh, magnetone. great. Yeah, they just did the new slash amp, and I had to keep quiet about it because that's that's a circuit we've been talking about for a long time, and he did it with slash, but that's all right. Anyway, those things are like 22 watts, and it's like, God almighty, holy crap, that's loud. But they're those old amps... I mean, matchless. I mean, at this point, I guess matchless. The original ones are might be able to be considered old. Yeah, vintage, vintage by guitar center respect. But it's fucking nineties, you know. Yeah, but uh, those old amps, even when loud, they're just extremely musical. I I'll take out a hundred watt super bass, and uh, but it just it it sits in. But the other thing is too patting ourselves on the back here because we understand our music and our instruments so well we're able to be dynamic with it there's a way to be you know get that amp overdrive without seeming loud it also has to do a lot with front of house and we have a great team with us too and just some trickery here and there i'm not gonna lie but yeah yeah did you guys see mr jimmy oh man you're gonna want to see this when we're done with the show mr jimmy i had him on the podcast Mr. Jimmy is a guy who grew up in Japan, obsessed with Jimmy Page. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I know who he is. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So there's a documentary. It came out about six months ago on him, and it is fantastic. And it is really interesting as of what we're talking about 
where, you know, his whole vision is like a 73 show or a 77 show, but the fans, the surface quote unquote fans and the promoters are like, Hey, just play the hits. What's this 28 yeah. minute, no quarter bullshit. You know, <laughs> the fans are walking out on this, you know, they're, well, they're not the fans, you know, they just want to hear black dog yeah. and whole lot of love, you know, and all that. But I highly recommend you see it because his yeah. obsession with the gear and my obsession was like that too. I was obsessed with gear. I love, even if I don't play music now and I love gear so fucking much, man, it's artistic. It's the design, you know, I I've got a, a banker Karina V here that is just fucking beautiful, but you know, you get an AC fit. Like I had a fawn, you know, with black panel and you just get into that. You're just like, this is fucking great. You know? And his obsession will blow your fucking mind, man. What he does, it's crazy. Rewinding constantly of of pickups and finding the right ohm, you know, homage on the fucking pots and and redoing his marshals. I mean, this guy is, cr- and he plays the shit out of the guitar. You got to see it. It's called Mister Jimmy. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I'm sure I was even harder for him because when he was getting into it you know you couldn't just go on youtube and click back like you had to actually re- physically rewind it to the right spot so it's like geez like the gear was a lot cheaper but, well yeah <laughs> but uh, it's funny yeah. you mentioned the whole thing about the real fans don't walk out uh the theater you're you're going to be at in st louis fox theater there's a classic story about zappa there in 71 yeah. It's Flo and Eddie era, which is my favorite Zappa era. And he he started off, I can't remember what book it was, but he started off oh, the show, yeah. he walks out, he <laughs> sits in a chair and he starts reading. I, it might have been the dictionary or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. But he's reading for like an hour and everybody's leaving. And then he gets to a point, <laughs> he closes it, he takes his 15 minute union break. And then he says, all right, now I know who my real fans are. And then it's, it's a legendary show, it's Zappa 71 at the Fox. Well, it's it's interesting. I'm a huge Black Crows guy. Huge. Yeah. Fucking love them. I've seen them, I don't know, 60, 70 times. People always go, come on, man. But that's the truth. I played gigs with some of the guys. Mark Ford played in my band a few, a few nights. And I've been a fan of them forever. What made me interested in them was once they got into the deep, deep tracks there's stuff that the Black Crows, where the, the She Talks to Angels fans leave immediately. If they're playing something like Pain and Eight or, you know, a deep song like, you know, Cursed Diamond. And, and then they're playing it for like 15 minutes. People are like, what is all this jam and shit, you know? But yeah. oh man, I became a dead fan because of the black crows i found the dead backwards because i grew up in the san francisco bay area i couldn't stand the dead i was like ah these fucking hippies you know and (laughs) now you know i went from black crows to almond brothers with warren haynes into you know grateful dead into dead and co now and Mm. holy shit man it's it's amazing to you get into this weird thing like the black crows right now are back they got a new record out it's fantastic but they're not going to be doing any of that jamming anymore because it it just seems like man we lost a lot of of people over the years and let's just get back into playing the songs like the records you know well i also like i don't know i i think we're at an interesting time where like i'm so appreciative of you know anyone that's dug what we're doing and like yeah we have some of like the hit type stuff but like live we have when we have our headline shows we have at least two like songs that are 15 to 20 minute kind of jam medleys some of it's just completely like you know that night we're we're thinking we're feeling in the moment and like improvising but i am curious because like you know i think the other part of like the crows on top of you know, them wanting to play the hits because they've been, you know, all the, the stuff that's gone on. It's like, man, I, I worry that the whole idea of like people's attention spans being so like, minimized. It's like, man, is that going to impact the music? Because I really hope it doesn't. Because like the most kind of like you're talking about with the Crows, it's like, man, the most powerful musical experiences I've had are those 
when you're locked into like a jam, like, you know, whether it's Allman Brothers Mountain Jam or like some of their extended stuff on the like the Fillmore record or, you know, live Zeppelin stuff, bootlegs, whatever. It's like there's some of the, the most it, just powerful musical things there. And I'm afraid that that like, are we going to lose that since everyone's attention span is being whittled down to three seconds? You know, are they going to be like, oh, I can't sing this chorus. So, all right, we're getting the Uber, you know, and and I don't know, maybe it will. But I I know that for us, like we're at least as a band on the same page, we're like, hey, we're going <laughs> to we're still going to play this music the way we play, it, you know, at least yeah. for now. But I, I do wonder if that's, you know, that's part of a symptom of that, too. You know, I think what? it's the base you come up in, you know. So let's put it like Black Crows came out and they had some big, big radio hits and then they started to change. Uh, yeah. so their their fan base started in the hit hit song world where somebody like The Dead or Fish or those are you know, Zappa and stuff. They were never hit song bands. You know, I mean, Touch of Grey was a hit, but that was way deep in. So I think it's really how you start at the beginning, you know, yeah. when you're growing stuff like a, a Metallica, you know, some of their songs were like fucking 12 minutes, but there were extreme thrash metal music and they weren't geared around. I mean, fuck one of their hits. One was a fluke and that thing's like eight minutes or seven minutes, you know? So I think it's where you, where your seeds were grown at. You know, and yeah, yeah, you know, like we said, the ADD world is fucking brutal. But I go to a Dead & Co show and I see people, they have no problem with the 18 minute morning do, you know? Oh, yeah. I saw an 18 minute Eyes of the World last summer. Sick. Yeah. And nobody, <laughs> nobody's going, wrap it up, you know? <laughs> holy shit. And I'm saying holy shit myself. But, you know, the Black Crows, when they get into a 21 minute My Morning song or, you know, No Speak, No Slave, I'm fucking in, man. You know, yeah. well, it's the other there's another way to look at it, too. Maybe not another way, but another point is most bands starting out don't have the platform to do so when it comes to live. I mean, we we released a, a live EP and it has I don't know if we're ballsy or what. It's just what we do. We have a song that it's 10 minutes long. It's a jam. Pete has a drum solo in it. It has a cover within it. So we, we, we've kind of been, we've tailored our set that we could do that. But a lot of people, you know, they're a new band. They just want to do song, 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 song. And we've done that too. I get it. But yeah, we've kind of set the, set the ground that, uh, well, this is us. And we have some stuff. We have this one song that it's going to, we say it's epic. I don't know, but it, it can be anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes eastern song i don't know yeah. if it's gonna stay that but it's like proggy it's bluesy it's elizabeth reed it's guitar instrumental and the thing about people's adhd is i might be different because i listen to things like early genesis that has all these crazy arrangements but to me it's like man things are changing every three seconds so it's like it's like multiple songs so, and so i think there's yeah. going to be people who are like this sucks. There's going to be people be like, man, this is awesome. And there's also going to be people that are like, all right, I can tolerate this. I'm going to stay for the whole show. Yeah. Because I don't know. It's, we've had a lot of actually, uh, deadheads are starting to follow us, which That's I don't know. find awesome because it's a loyal fan base and you know, those are music people. So I don't know. It's, it's like, it's, it's, we, there's two sides. Like I was saying earlier, there's no identity. It's like, we're just going to do it. And there's some things that we aren't going to do. Yeah. But, you know, we're not going to, I don't, I don't know of an example, but it's, yeah. we're going to stay us well, and it, whatever we make is going to be us. I think an interesting thing too, that like related to what you're saying about like how it depends on where you start is like, what's been honestly, what's been so great about literally the past, you know, just couple weeks or months of how, you know, people are starting to take notice about what we're doing is that like, we have been very intentional about like, here's what we want to do. Here's, you know, we're not showing up to the gig and hit and play on, on the computer and then just running our hits to make sure that we hit the time. <clears throat> like, and we've had people that have like, you know, we've, you know, we'll see the comments and some stuff. And some, when we did that, you know, 10, 15 minute thing where I do a drum solo or whatever, and we're opening for someone, which is like, that's kind of, you know, that might be a naive move, but we're like, whatever, screw it. Like, that's what we're doing. You know, 
yeah, there's some people in the comments like, no opener should have a drum solo and and be playing some boring jam. And we're like, okay, so yeah. sorry, we'll be like 99% of other bands and play a bunch of songs that you don't know, so you're not going to get into. But it, it, it comes down to, it doesn't matter. But yeah, it, it, the whole it, thing. It, so... it, these people try to fucking think there's rules. Exactly. You know? And exactly. it's fucking insane. I love the Bill yeah. Hicks thing, you know, as a comedian. He was like, play to the highest IQ in the room and yeah. just weed yeah. the other fucking clowns out because totally. you know, these people, they just think there's these rules like, hey, man, you, you shouldn't be doing this. And it's like, well, it affected you enough for you to reach out. So <laughs> that's literally OK. I, you know, I don't know how many we'll see how many people actually want to hear him and I talk this long. But for yeah. anyone that gets this deep. That's been our whole freaking TikTok philosophy is yeah, like, I hey, like we're going to say people. like, I mean, we're not going crazy <laughs> of just like saying absurd. I've seen some bands who are like, this is the greatest rock band in 2024. And it's like, we're not doing that. Yeah. But we're going to throw out a couple names that are influences and be like, hey, this is what we're like. It's, if half the comments are there to say, no, you're wrong. You don't sound like that. Yeah, we got we got you to comment. We're still going to find find the people. Who yeah, do and and so that's been part of our approach lately. Is like, hey, like, no, we're not going to say arrogant, absurd stuff, but we are going to like put some stuff out there that's going to get people. You know, maybe it's controversial. And honestly, Tom and I have talked about this a lot, and it, it does kind of suck that that's where we're at in the era of like rock music. But like, you know, part of that was part of Greta Van Fleet's whole thing is like. The, the the reason he and I knew about that, I, the reason like the first conversation when we heard about them, it was probably 2017 or 18. And he goes, dude, have you heard this band? Like, you know, it's, you know, it's just like Zeppelin or something. And that controversy, you know, as much as, you know, honestly, I, I don't want to be in their shoes because of some of the hate and some of the stuff people say. Yeah. Right. But that controversy had people talking about him and, you know, and it's like, there's I think there's a fine line of uh, that, you know, again, we're experimenting with, but there is sort of this <laughs> thing of like trying to create some sort of interest, whether it's positive or negative, just so you get in front of more people and you kind of see through that. Oh, you end up getting a lot of positive that that yeah. kind of backs off the We've negative way more. Late. The, the owner of the comedy store, her name is Mitzi Shore. Rest yeah, Mitzi. Peace. yeah, yeah. She, her philosophy philosophy was you want half the people to hate you and half of them to love you because yeah. then they're always talking about you. Yeah. You know, oh. and that's the fucking truth. You know, it's crazy. I grew up in an era where there's a band called Kingdom Come and they sounded like, you know, Zeppelin exact. They had a song called Get It On and people called him Kingdom Clone. Now, they went away pretty quick because of some, you know, weird arrogance and stuff like, you know. But with Greta Van Fleet, the thing was, they had some quote unquote hit songs like the Highway song and stuff. So, you know, you, you're looking at it like, OK, well, they do kind of sound like that. But to me, that was just the naive ear because all I was hearing was heart. I was like, this is heart, you know straight on to you kind of vibe yeah. you know yeah. heart themselves the whole thing they were voted the yeah. best led zeppelin cover band in <laughs> seattle or wherever it was at right and, i mean i love heart but it's whether somebody likes greta van fleet or not what i was going to say to tj is you, if you're going to make claims if they're going to whatever you have to have something to back it up and again whether somebody likes their music or not like they had something to back it up it's like what getty lee says about kiss it's like think whatever you want about kiss they backed it up and they they owned it. But I hate to be one of those people that's like, I love hate. You know, that's that's cool. Like, I'll take the hate. But it is good to have those things because it makes you think. And you can have a vision and be focused on something. Here are the voices over here. You can still consider what they're saying. It's like, you know, we're not doing this for other people, but we, are, we do want to consider what the people want. You know, if, if people are hating on it and... You know, that's that's cool, too. Like, I, you know, a lot of people don't like ABBA. I do like just just leave it be. It, it's, yeah. it's 
it's cool yeah i don't walk right on well yeah and i think it's that's just like i don't know an interesting part of pursuing art as i, I know you and you know all, all of your peers pursuing comedy understand too because it's like if you are doing something that is truly you know like unique to yourself and it's genuine you're making decisions that are not you know don't follow the rules not for the sake of oh i'm breaking the rule but you know like it's because it's genuinely you like us doing you know freaking drum solo when we're opening for a band like that's because it is a genuine expression from like us th that's why it's not fitting into that box and it's like at the end of the day nobody no art is loved by 100 percent everybody uh, like that's why when i don't know there, there's so many things to talk about like man if, if art was a democracy it would be the worst art ever because it would just be like most vanilla boring it wouldn't stir right. anything it would just be the like whatever and I, I don't know i just the more that we've been doing this the more i find that and then it's it's the same that's again that's why i think it's so cool listening to like a lot of your guys journeys because it's the, it's the same stuff where you're like yeah. oh yeah a whole crowd thought I was the worst comedian they'd ever seen. Opinions. Two years later, you know, you I, I have a Netflix special or whatever. Like, oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I watched comedians that couldn't sell 10 tickets and now they're doing theaters and arenas yeah. a couple years later <clears throat> because a clip took off and it wasn't because they were bad or something, but there's gatekeepers that are like, no, nah, we're not letting you in. Or there's, you know, they're not getting any kind of exposure or they do get the exposure, but the people aren't grabbing onto it. It's it, there's all kinds of weird shit, and then either it goes or or you just keep going or you quit. Those are the three fucking things in art, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I don't but, know. I just find it really cool that there's a anyone you know that I've listened to that I respect like and really look up to within like you know whether it's drums music comedy whatever it's like it, you hear the same stuff over and over i know you've had so many like killer drummers on on your podcast and, and it's it's you hear the same stuff and it's exactly like this type of thing and the fact that we're kind of running into that firsthand right now in some ways is cool because i'm like okay we must be on the right path <laughs> but yeah. like you know it, it's great to hear it's great to have that encouragement and that the voices from all the other people that have dealt with that in the past too, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, every fucking band I've had on here, 740 episodes of what it is and, and the comedians <laughs> and myself, not once has a guy sat down and went, you know, man, I just had the fucking looks. I had the songs, I had the talent, the record company understood it right away. Signed <laughs> me and I sold a million. It's yeah. never, ever been that story. It's always been like, everyone said no. No one liked it. I lost a million band members over the years. I was grinding. I was on the floor. I was on my last fucking nickel. And then somebody said, wow. And then it caught fire. And it's always that, man. It's always the fucking no, 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 no. If you watch that Twisted Sister documentary... I can't even believe those guys kept Dude, going. That is the craziest thing ever. Like, that they, is. They had like, I don't know if you ever watched it. I've been telling them to watch it. Even if you don't like Twisted Sister, every everyone on earth needs to watch that and the Mike the Bulls documentary, The Last oh, Dance. Yeah, last if you're day. not yeah. motivated after that, something's wrong. Yeah. Twisted Sister, I think they said they, they counted. It was like five calendar dates in like 11 years that they had off. Yeah. And they were recording. Everybody said no. They could sell out everywhere in New York, and then yeah. Man. And then and then at one point they get a dude who's way into it. I think it's Jason Flom actually, <clears throat> and he's going, "I'm going to sign this." And the Atlantic president goes, "If you talk about that band again, you're <laughs> fucking fired." And he's like, "Wait, I just went and saw them. They sold out an arena in Jersey. They have no record totally. deal. We could sell at least." a hundred thousand records tomorrow and he's like i don't give a fuck they suck get out of here and man that is crazy shit oh, right it's, it, it just shows a persistence with a band like that too it was in the documentary they had a an a and r guy coming out or maybe a few maybe they're being chopped to showcase so to speak and they rented out this huge place that like kiss could have sold out and they they got all these crazy lights it was like a huge production and the the guitarist had like a 
a seizure or something a like heart that. attack or something the gig was terrible because it, i mean understandably so and by the end of the first song they had like left it was like they didn't pack it up though they're like all right let's go back to jersey and have the gig tonight and it's like you know again think what you yeah. want about the sister i think jj french is a genius businessman and as well as d snyder but it it's just that whole thing it's it's persistence and we it is. we have you know this much experience with it but i am proud of what we're doing because we uh, nick the guy i have the studio with and we were in a band with he's like it's going well for you dude because you've done literally nothing else and it's like well yeah maybe it's because i don't know i i can't play baseball anymore but you know it, it's just it's just cool i probably said that eight million times in this podcast but it's just cool man what do you guys let's get into it wrap it up here so you're touring as much as you can you're kind of opening for big bands you've opened some, for some great fucking bands what are you doing you're going to record your own record you have some stuff on apple music right now you got a ton of great stuff on youtube you have a youtube channel everybody check that out feel f-e-e-l and then they have a tiktok and an instagram are you guys recording a record with your, now that you have the singer situated, all that, what's yeah. going on? Yeah, yeah. we're recording, we're in the midst of recording a full length. We have about, I don't know, maybe half of it or so yeah. done. And we're kind of, we're planning on putting it out, hopefully late summer, maybe later this year. Some business stuff might affect how all that goes. But we are in the midst of recording that for anyone that's been, you know, asking about when we'll have more stuff out. But yeah, otherwise, I would I'd pay attention to what we're doing. We're we try to be super active on socials, especially like Instagram and TikTok. And uh, yeah, we're just we're, we've got more a lot more stuff in the hopper for sure. That I mean, even in the past couple of days, we just did a music video and some other stuff. So. Yeah, I don't know what else is. Yeah, I mean, it's just we're kind of at the point right now that it's decisions are having to be made based on if we should release these things right now, just because the nature of the business side of things and making a little bit of noise. So we're we're not entirely sure exact dates, but we got plenty of music on the way. That, that, yeah, that's right. for sure. Oh, yeah. And how about some shows coming up? Any shows? Yeah, we've got uh, the next one. We have a headlining show. It's it's down around us, but it's in a, a town called Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And we don't lately we we've kind of intentionally chosen not to do a ton of headlining stuff just for the sake of like exposure. And, you know, we're fortunate enough to be able to get asked to be on certain dates with some bigger artists. We're trying to like leverage that a bit. We are, we have been discussing, like, we're trying to work out, you know, tour out stuff, what would make sense for headlining stuff, you know, maybe this summer. That show, though, sorry, I just circled around that. That show is April 6th. And then we have, there's a bunch that were, are, are in the works, but then the other, only other ones we have announced right now are May 10th. We're opening for this girl named Hannah Wickland in Indianapolis who she actually dates one of the Greta Van Fleet guys, I think. Um, oh, wow. We just opened for her in Cincinnati. And she, yeah, she's she, so we're opening for her in Indianapolis, May 10th. And then we are playing one of the days of Rockfest in, I don't know how you say it, say it Kadot, Kado, okay. Wisconsin. It's the big rock festival they have up there. And we're kind of in a weird slot. We're on like a, it's technically if you buy the three-day pass for the actual festival, we're on the Wednesday before opening for like I think Vince Neil. Yeah, um, those are just the announced dates. We've got others we haven't announced yet. Yeah, just yeah. like I said about the music, we're in the period of time where we're being contacted by a bunch of things, you know, upper people in business and just venues and stuff. So just trying to navigate all of that, but yeah, it's all on the social medias. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll see you this week in St. Louis, man. That'd be that great. Is. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Come come, come see the show and hang out. And it'll right be on. great to meet you guys face to face. DM me and I'll hit you with the my phone number and we'll get that all together. Yeah, and absolutely. Thanks for doing the show. And I can't wait to see you guys live. And I look forward to watching your career take off, man, because yeah. I, I can tell it's it's in there. You got the chemistry and you've got the right fit now. And you guys are smart. 
you're putting you know together your own video you're recording your own shit you're self-made you're in-house you know so you're not one of those bands going man i wish we got a fucking record deal you're just doing it you're out there and i really appreciate that man watching people go for it you know and thank you for doing the show oh we're so grateful for the not only the opportunity, but just the encouragement and the sending stuff to your buddies and just that you're into it. It, it yeah. means everything, and we couldn't do it without you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, seriously, thanks a ton for having us. I mean, <laughs> when I was going through some of the other, you know, I've listened to some of your stuff, but when I was going through it, then I was kind of like, oh my gosh, like these, you've talked to a lot of the people that are like some of my heroes in, in you know, in drumming and, and guys I look up to a lot. So it's, it is an honor to, to be on here for sure. Now, one last thing. It's, the feel band is the Instagram, right? At the band called Feel. Yeah. That's it. There's a lot of things on earth called feel. Yes. So at the band called feel. The band that called just feel. our socials, but we are feel. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. band called Feel is yeah. socials, everybody. I just want because yeah, if you're gonna search for it, you put in feel. Oh my god, even on Amazon, <laughs> music yeah. house, like, what the fuck, man? Yeah. 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 Some interesting things might pop up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cop a feel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And I uh, will see you this week. Great fucking talking to you guys. And uh, there you guys, everybody, follow them on Instagram. And don't forget to leave a review and subscribe to my podcast on YouTube and iTunes. I greatly appreciate it. And thank you guys. I'll see you this week. Awesome. Thank you so hey, much. Man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Later, guys. Yeah.